There are few things that I hate more than when you're on one of those team building days or your first day at school or university and someone says, what we're going to do is we're going to go around the room and I want you all to say your name and something interesting about yourselves. Now, don't worry, there's, there's too many of you to do it now, unfortunately. But I hate that, it's such a horrible exercise. And fortunately now, I have a couple of stock anecdotes that I can use. And the one I use at the moment, I say, hi, my name's James. And a couple of years ago, I was arrested by the Bulgarian Navy. And I like that one. I think it has just the right weight of intrigue. <laughs> And it's true, it's a good story. A couple of years ago, I was arrested by the Bulgarian Navy. And I was taken along with my friend, Nathan Wilkins. We were taken into the gatehouse of their Navy base and held under an armed guard for seven hours. During that time, we were given a small plastic cup of coffee. A translator was found to help us out. And we were separated into two different rooms where we were individually questioned. And when we left, we agreed with the military that we wouldn't discuss in great detail everything that we had been asked. So with that in mind, all I'll say is that they asked us pretty much everything you can imagine, right? And what they were trying to do was build up this very detailed picture of exactly who we were so that they could understand why they had found us trespassing on their Navy base 2,700 miles from our home. But the story, I'm afraid, starts years earlier, my first year at university, when I saw this unobtrusive little poster that said, up to £3,000 for your winning idea. And I thought, though I didn't have a winning idea, if I could come up with one, then someone might give me this money. And so that's what I did. I went away, and at the time, I was vaguely interested in canoeing. I had very little experience, but I'd done a 10-day trip the year before, and I'd read loads about people who had canoed all the way across North America. And I thought, that's what I'd love to do. But as I researched it, I discovered that actually, the very same concept, canoeing all the way across the continent, hadn't quite fully been done before here in Europe not without walking 100 miles across the mountains. And so I went onto Google Maps, nothing more technical than that, and I created this. What was to become the route for the Canoeing the Continent expedition? Uh, now, this is a fraction under 3,000 miles long. It goes through 10 different countries, and in total took us 147 days to complete. And crucially for me, this was truly canoeing the continent. Every waterway here links directly into the next. So the longest walk we would ever do was just 100 metres around a lock or a hydroelectric dam. And I took this map and I went about recruiting a friend to sit in the other end of the canoe from me. And in doing so, of course, I had to talk to people, tell people what I was doing and publicise the idea. And that committed me to the fact I had to do it. So by the time I presented this map and this idea to this committee of people with their funding, well, whether they decided to help me or not, I realised I kind of had to go and do it anyway. And so it was that on the 1st of July, Nathan and I pushed our canoe into the River Loire, the longest river in France, and we began to paddle upstream against the current. And the learning curve was certainly very steep. In those first couple of weeks, we capsized, we had almost half our stuff stolen. We went uh, just about 10, 10 miles a day, 10 painful miles. But none of those are reasons to go home. Progress was still progress, and we gradually got into the rhythm of what we were doing. We were living this nomadic existence, where we packed up our things each morning and headed off to somewhere new. And there's something incredibly liberating about that. The night our things were stolen, for example, we went back to the canoe and our bags had been ripped open, loads of our stuff was gone. But crucially, we still had the canoe. And that's the only truly essential item for what we'd be doing. So that night, we took it in turns. One person stayed awake in case anyone returned. And the other person slept for an hour in the grass in the one remaining sleeping bag. And when the sun rose, we paddled back downstream to a town where we could buy some more gear and file a full police report. And then we got back in the canoe and paddled away. 
both literally and metaphorically, we could just leave the whole incident behind. And that was really freeing. It was true of every obstacle, no matter how long it may have taken or how difficult it may have been to overcome. Well, once we were past it, we never had to return to that point again, and we left it stronger and wiser and more experienced. And so eventually we did get off the Loire and through a section of canals to the Rhine, a huge artery of European trade where we dwarfed on the water by these massive tankers. And from there we went on more canals to the Danube, the second longest river in Europe. And now it was September. The greens of summer were becoming the reds of autumn and we were finally going downstream 40 or 50 miles a day through huge cities like Vienna, Bratislava, this is Budapest here, and Belgrade, and then out into the wide open expanses of the lower Danube, where the river is up to two miles wide, and at night we'd camp on small islands or on the riverbanks in the woods where we'd keep a stick inside our tent because you could hear packs of wild dogs howling in the woods around you. But I'm pleased to say we did it. We got to the Black Sea and we celebrated by getting drunk on a couple of beers that we later translated as non-alcoholic. <laughs> uh, but as you might have noticed earlier when I showed you the map, that wasn't actually our end point. Something that shows my sheer lack of canoeing knowledge was that we actually planned to go all the way down the Black Sea coast to Istanbul in the very edge of Europe. And this is where things started to go a little bit wrong for us. Now it was November, which is a dangerous time for any boat to be at sea really, let alone a little canoe with low cut sides and an open top. And we quickly discovered we'd get caught in these wintry storms where the waves would engulf our boat. And we couldn't get on the water. But we didn't want to give up. We were so close to the finish line. So what we decided to do was walk along the beaches. That way we could always keep an eye on the waves and go out the second it was calm enough. And this was a really good idea. But with the rivers behind us, we were now carrying 10 litres of fresh water along with our five months worth of gear and our canoe and our paddles. And we couldn't carry all of that at once, so we had to do this relentless relay where we'd go 100 metres with the canoe and then back for the bags. 200 metres with the bags and then back for the canoe. 200 metres with the canoe and back for the bags. Back and forth, tripling the physical distance we had to go for the actual distance we gained. And it was, it was really agonising, mentally and physically. And as a result, we took more and more risks going out on the water when really we knew it wasn't that safe. And in one particular incident, we went out across this sheltered bay and rounded a headland into these huge swell waves, waves that are higher, about the height of the top of the projector there. And when you're in that situation, you can't just turn around and go back to where you were. Because if you turn your little boat side on to a wave that big, you're just going to get flipped into the sea. So we had to hold our line and hold our nerve and get closer to the rocks until we could find a patch where we slammed our canoe down and pulled everything ashore. And when we settled our jangling nerves and picked up the canoe to start walking again, we found in the heather around us these little metal targets peppered with bullet marks. And on the horizon was a squad of smartly dressed soldiers holding their rifles. And of course, there we were, standing on the target end of a rifle range inside the Bulgarian Navy base. And pretty swiftly we were arrested, and so goes the story I told you earlier. But that was a real watershed moment for us, right? It was a moment when we realised just how much danger we had been in. Not inside the Navy base, but it, out on the water, where we had no real control over our boats, and consequently no real control over our lives. And in the spirit of adapting to the obstacles and learning from our mistakes, we realised that this was the moment to adapt to the fact we couldn't canoe safely any longer. And so we left the canoe and set off across the mountains to cover the last 250 miles to Istanbul on foot. And we did that in just 10 days with a big 35 miler on the last day where we walked all the way into the city centre, through the old city walls and finished outside what we thought was the only building a couple of 22-year-old Brits in Turkey could finish outside, a kebab shop. <laughs> now after the expedition, I returned to university to give a very brief presentation on what we'd done. And I went up to this top floor corridor and I found 
the poster still hanging there, and I have it here now. I discreetly took it home with me. And you can see it's not particularly interesting, right? It's quite a cool photo, but otherwise it's pretty small and quite bland. But I took it because this poster represents to me the fact that this whole opportunity was literally staring me in the face. And all I really had to do to do it was be the one that broke the mold of looking at our phones, going into the lecture, and just engage with it. And I think that's kind of a little bit true of all of us, me now as much as anyone else. We all get into this cycle of daily routine, but often the most interesting experiences are the ones that involve making that little extra effort to do something different. And I appreciate, of course, that you don't want to have a poster staring you in the face, but we still have a stream of opportunities, whether that's emails in our inbox, people in our lives, ideas we get from books or the internet. And it's up to no one other than you to seize those ideas and run with them. And when I look back at some of the huge challenges that I faced, I'm always very aware that actually the hardest part of the whole thing was committing myself to doing it in the first place. Because once our boat was in the water, we could literally go with the flow, right? We could learn as we went along. But if I'd foreseen all those problems and I'd dwelt on the idea, then perhaps I'd never have bothered trying in the first place. And I'd never have known what I missed out on. So, if you have your own winning idea, and you already know that it's going to be a challenge anyway, then why not just focus on those early stages, what it is you need to do to commit yourself to it, and give yourself that early momentum? Because perhaps then, like me, you'll find that the ball just starts rolling, and who knows where you'll find yourself. Hopefully not arrested in Bulgaria, right? But I'm still confident that if any of you found yourself in that situation, then you'd secretly be just as thrilled about it as I was, because you'll know that at the end of the day, you were the one with the sheer audacity to put yourself in that position. And therefore, you'll know that you are also the one with the tenacity to get yourself out of it again. Thank you very much for listening.